again in the van of the British challenge for outright victory at Le Mans, the Jaguars were early arrivals at the scrutineering van. But this year, the team had been reshuffled and Mike Hawthorne was to be the number one driver, partnered by 500cc expert Ivor Buett, and their racing number, six. The entry was as fully representative of the sports cars of the world as in any previous race. The nationalities of cars and drivers together adding up to nothing short of a United Nations of motor racing. And once again, the Germans had re-entered the field, determined upon a repeat performance of their 23rd hour victory in 1952. Sterling Moss was to share their number one car with Fangio, and Alfred Neubauer was there, for wherever Mercedes go, there is to be seen the formidable shape of their team manager. Young Castellotti has his Ferrari in the lead from teammate Malioli. Then comes Mike Hawthorne, the American and Belgian entered Jaguars, Peter Collins' Aston Martin, the two-litre Ferrari, Parnell's Legonda, the Mercs of Lebec and Kling, then Bob Dixon's TR2. Jaguar pursues Ferrari. Don Bowman closes on Phil Walters. Macklin settles down to the job and Bob Dixon chases hard. From the start. Pierre Levesque in Mercedes number 20 is content to leave it to Fangio to dice with Hawthorne in the lead and the Frenchman lies behind the Kling Seymour Mercedes which is fifth. Fangio and Moss make more use of their air brake than the other Mercedes drivers, and their car, which lies second to Hawthorne's Jaguar, is about to lap its two teammates. Now coming up to halfway through the third hour, the first of the scheduled pit stops are being made. The time, 6.26. Levesque's Mercedes has hit Lance Macklin's Austin Heath. The veteran Frenchman is killed instantly. Macklin escapes by a miracle, but the flaming wreckage of the German car, together with the blast of what appears to be a major explosion, wreaks havoc in the dense crowd of spectators. Drivers, unaware of the magnitude of the disaster, continue with the job in hand. But marshals and mechanics now tackle the tricky task of moving the wreckage of the Healy. For a long time, the Mercedes burns at the roadside. The race has brought with it the worst disaster in motor racing history. Now, Ivor Buev has taken over number six from Hawthorne, and Sterling Moss has relieved Fangio in number 19. Les Brook comes into the corner. And the sandbanks claim another victim, albeit saving the driver from physical injury. Meantime, at the pits also, fortunes continue to fluctuate as the battle in the classes is well and truly joined. The McAlpine Thompson Connaught was a fancied British challenger in the one and a half litre group but after going extremely well initially, the car was destined to be out of the race by midnight. Not so our Mr. Brooks. No doubt recalling the delights of seaside holidays as a child, Leslie puts his back into the sandcastle business. Sterling Moss now leads the race for Mercedes, although the lap record at 121.9 still stands to Hawthorne's Jagger. In the pits, the work which can win or lose this race continues hour by hour. As one car rejoins the circuit, another is expected in. Engrossed in the routine of effort and rest, 
drivers begin to lose touch with normal time. Mechanics are thinking in terms of tire wear. Timekeepers count the hours in minutes and seconds. But out at Terre Rouge, Les Brook counts the minutes by the shovelful. Along with the Mercedes, no fewer than six Porsches represent the German industry. This is the car shared by Seidel and Olivier Genderby. By this time, the field is thinning out, and as it does so, the cars in British Racing Green become conspicuous for their reliability. At 9 p.m., Carl Kling is 10th, 25 miles behind Moss. Malioli is third behind Hawthorne. It's Mercedes, Jaguar, Ferrari, Jaguar, Jaguar, Maserati. A struggle as international as any ever seen at Le Mans, and it's running at record speed. Now the problem of failing light is added to the increasing strain on drivers. But to Les Brook, the twilight was to bring the reward for his heroic effort. At the eighth hour, the position had changed. The Mercedes led the Jaguar by nearly two laps, but the Kling Simon car was a further two laps back and third with the other two works Jaguars on its tail. Now Le Mans assumed its midnight gaiety, for even now the vast crowds at the circuit had no idea of the magnitude of the disaster six hours before. But at 2 a.m., the Mercedes are withdrawn. At that time, Moss led Hawthorne by a lap and a half. But the Jaguar had a pit stop in hand, and there were 14 hours to go. A race is never over till it's won, and there were further drastic changes in the next two hours. The Ferrari challenge ended in anticlimax as one by one they fell. The Bowman Jewish Jaguar left the road. The Maserati of Valenzano and Musso climbed through the depleted field. As daylight returned to the circuit, the Hawthorne Buick Jaguar led by five laps at 111 miles an hour from the Maserati. One lap behind came the Peter Collins, Paul Frey, Aston Martin, then the Rolt Hamilton Jaguar, which was obviously in trouble. Hawthorne drove on with undiminished mastery. Peter Collins embarked upon a grim pursuit of the Maserati. This was still a motor race with a vengeance. As the morning wore on, Peter Collins, Aston Martin wore down that Maserati challenge. The Italian car was abandoned, and British cars were one, two, three. The Aston is second. The new MG has made its bow. The Belgian Jaguar is third, and nothing can stop Mike Hawthorne now. Le Mans of 1955 is over. The winner had covered a record distance of 2,592 miles at 107 miles an hour. The pace throughout the race in every class had been a killing one. Yet of the 21 cars which passed the chequered flag, 13 were products of the British industry, an achievement of which we may all be justly proud. And although the race must go down in the annals as one of tragedy, let no one gainsay the heroic drive of Mike Hawthorne and his partner Ivor Buick. The three production model Triumph TR2s had done exactly what they set out to do. Their final placings, 14th, 15th and 19th in the general classification, was no mean achievement against a field made up largely of near single-seater racing cars. In the hands of distinguished drivers, three started, three finished. And throughout the 24 hours of Le Mans, not one encountered a single mechanical failure of any kind. <laughs>